One of the challenges of modern work, and the reason why I'm going to try and do a takedown of, of bad bosses, is what someone said to me. Someone said to me, I think I'm one of the good guys, but inside of me, there's an 18th century mill owner that when people aren't at their desks at 9 o'clock or when people aren't back at their desks at 2.30, I immediately start thinking everyone's taking the piss. And the understanding the 18th century mill owner is an important part of, of us trying to solve work. So the 18th century mill owner is the person who maybe knows that flexibility is a good thing or knows that we're all working an extra two hours a day, but then wants a degree of control. And in fact, all of us, when there's moments where we feel powerless, we revert to trying to have more control. So let me show you the legion of, of bosses that we're going to, to look at today. And so these are Ferdinand Peach, he works at Volkswagen. Uh, Elon Musk, I think you'll be familiar with his work. Frank Lloyd Wright. I, in the course of writing this presentation, the amount of time I've spent gazing at that photograph of Frank Lloyd Wright. People don't do uh, profile photos like that anymore, do they? <laughs> <laughs> if you're engaged with Frank Lloyd Wright on social media with that photograph, you'd have a, a, a very loose impression of him. And Reed Hastings. So we're going to do those things. What I'm going to take them to task for is stress, working hours, open plan offices, and not being a family. So we're going to go to these things in turn. So let's start with Fr Ferdinand Peach. And you won't know Ferdinand Peach. Ferdinand Peach, uh, it was the former CEO, former chairman of Volkswagen. Now, I'm going to describe to you the scenario that happened during the, the VW Dieselgate affair. Um, in 2005, Volkswagen set themselves the goal of being the number one auto manufacturer in the world, overtaking GM and overtaking Toyota. And one of the ways that they knew that they had to do that was that they had to deploy a more fuel-efficient and cleaner diesel engine. One of the challenges they had is that their CEO um, was, uh, was regarded as uh, brash, uh, Herr Winterkorn, regarded as brash, was, was renowned for shouting at a lot of people. But in many ways, people attributed that to the former CEO, Ferdinand Peach. And people used to say that often when presented with challenges, uh, they, they, the, the answer no wasn't acceptable. In fact, uh, Amy Edmondson, who's a, a writer who's looked at a lot of the themes I'm going to talk about today, writes a lot about psychological safety. In her brand new book, The Fearless Organization, she describes a scenario where when presented with the challenge of trying to create these new clean diesel engines, an engineer said, we'll try, we'll give it our best go, but we cannot do impossible. But the challenge was that impossible was what they were expecting. And in fact, the diesel engine, that they, the, the cleanliness that they needed to create was way beyond what VW were capable of. To pass US emission standards, the, in fact, the, the engines, uh, the, the final engines, adopted a, a cheat technology. When they found that they were being tested, they went into a clean mode. And uh, effectively, that was 40 times cleaner than they were actually were when they were on the roads. And largely, Amy Edmondson attributes this to the climate that existed within the organisation. She gives this quote to Ferdinand Peach. He said in one meeting, you have six weeks, talking about the body work that was happening on cars, you have six weeks, I have all of your names. If we do not have good body fits in six weeks, I will replace all of you. So... I thought we'd take a look at whether that was good science or whether that was bad science. <laughs> now, what Amy Edmondson is famous for is, is discussion of psychological safety. And in fact, if you ever find yourself trying to understand good workplace culture, psychological safety is one of the two go-to themes that seems to exist. Amy Edmondson discovered this when she was doing some work studying hospitals. And she, uh, the hospitals she went out, she went out and she researched hospitals. She wanted to know whether good teams uh, were higher performing than bad teams. She went out to, over the course of a long period of time, she gathered a lot of evidence about operating theatre teams in hospitals. And in fact, it was the last piece of data she decided to add to the research, which gave her a, a sort of surprising insight. She went out and she asked teams to evaluate whether they felt that they, were, they regarded their teammates as highly competent, if they had high faith in their ability to do the job well. And then finally, she just added a final data set, which was uh, the number of clinical errors, the number of uh, errors that the teams were making, convinced that the best teams would make the fewest mistakes. 
And here's where she was confounded. The best teams were making 10 times more mistakes than the worst teams. And she was baffled by that, because surely all of the other data that she'd gathered would suggest that the best teams would make fewer mistakes. She went back and she chatted firsthand to the people involved. And what she found was, the best teams weren't making 10 times the mistakes. The best teams were admitting to making 10 times the mistakes. And this is what Amy Edmondson styled psychological safety. Psychological safety is our ability, our willingness to speak up. In fact, in the, in the words of the person who pioneered the concept, uh, she, she adopted it, but the, the guy who pioneered it, a guy called William Kahn, he described psychological safety as the benefit of the doubt. Feeling that if you say you, to your boss that you've done something, your boss will give you the benefit of the doubt that you had good intentions. Now, psychological safety is a really critical thing, and you can imagine when we talk about the work of Ferdinand Peach, that obviously that was going to be absent. If people weren't allowed to say that we can't deliver these clean engines, we, they weren't able to say that we can't deliver this good bodywork, then the, it was going to be in opposition to getting things done. But I also want to take Ferdinand Peach aside and uh, challenge him for one other thing, and that's whether creating a climate of stress actually is productive and creative. And for that, I want to go and take a look at the work of a guy called uh, Jack, uh, Jack Pansep. Jack Pansep was at Georgetown University in the US, and uh, about 40 years ago, he was a pioneering neuroscientist. He spent a lot of time studying the work, uh, studying the brains of mammals. And in fact, one of the things that Jack Pansep said is he said that the seven systems inside every mammal's brain, the most dominant of which is the fear system. So the fear system effectively acts as a sort of kill switch. It stops you doing certain things when you're in a state of anxiety. If you see a 10-ton truck cruising towards you on the street, you don't start brainstorming, for example. Uh, it, it, it ensures that you actually take sort of rapid response. And Jack Pansep said that there were, there were seven systems inside every mammal's brain. The reason why he was particularly taken with rats is he said rats had what humans have. They have a, a heightened seeking system. It's what you or I might call creativity. The example, of, the example of a seeking system is you put two rats in a cage for five minutes, and he said you could count 50 instances of seeking or play where they would be pulling things, biting things, testing things. They're incredibly uh, creative, exploratory animals. But the interesting thing from Jack Pansep's point of view was what happened when you put those systems in opposition to each other. So when you allowed the fear system to trigger, what did it do to the creative seeking system? So he, he did it by putting a piece of cat hair in the cage. Now this is something that you can observe in rats as, as young as two or three weeks old, rats who've never seen a cat but they seem to have this atavistic programming that, that when they s detect a predator, they'll respond to it. So he put a piece of cat hair in the cage with these two rats. They went from 50 instances of seeking to zero instances of seeking. In fact, such was the impact of it that even when he cleaned the cage, he, he completely uh, changed their surroundings, there was still a stress hangover. In fact, they only returned to about 35 instances of seeking over the course of the next three or four days. Stress kills our capacity to be creative, and that is the way that their brain was designed. So when we're thinking about Ferdinand Peach, actually creating a stressful environment might be directly in conflict with achieving his goals. I'm not going to leave discussion of Jack Pansep without showing them my favourite part of his work, and that is he was convinced he could make rats laugh. We're going to see some rats laugh. This is... This is Jack Pansep tickling a rat. So he said that his favourite part of the start of every day was he would go into his lab and he would tickle the rats. Now, you have to imagine that he had a device that David Attenborough might have knocking around the house that he listened to bats with, and he tuned it down. So what you're going to hear is a slightly tuned down, low frequency, uh, high frequency of a rat laughing. Here we go. We're about to see a rat laugh. I know what you're thinking. <laughs> that is not laughter. <laughs> what Jack said is he said, OK, to demonstrate, if I move my hand to the opposite side of the box, if the rat follows my hand, the rat was laughing. If the rat doesn't follow my hand, it believes that it was some way torturous. So here we go.
There you go. <laughs> Fascinating. In fact, just to back up my work, just to demonstrate that this wasn't the work of one scientist, here's the work of neuroscientist Gregory Burns. Gregory Burns from Emory University. He said, uh, in a, this was in a quotation that you'll find on that link from a New York Times article, the most concrete thing that neuroscience tells us is that when the fear system of the brain is active, exploratory activity and risk-taking are turned off. So, let's return to our panel of experts. Now... I want to be sure that we're giving everyone the opportunity to, to be assessed, but I think on the basis of the research that we've explored using work from uh, Gregory Burns, Jack Pansep and Amy Edmondson, I think it's fair to say that Ferdinand Peach is cancelled. So next we're going to go on and we're going to take a look at Elon Musk. Now, what you'll see here is there's a photograph... I've blown it up here. This is a photograph. Yes, those are tears in his eyes. This was an interview that uh, Elon Musk did just before Christmas, alongside this, which was what he tweeted. So in the interview on, on 60 Minutes just before Christmas, he said that you, you should be expecting to work a minimum of 80 hours a week as a good working week. And in fact, he tweeted to someone, nobody ever changed the world on 40 hours a week. So... I thought, wonder what science could tell us about that. So let's go and have a look. There's an incredible danger that we fall victim of believing the lies that we tell ourselves, right? My favourite example of the lies we tell ourselves, there's a lot of people who believe that they don't need sleep. As if anyone's read the wonderful book by Matthew Taylor, uh, Why We Sleep, uh, sleep scientists were especially interested in this. So quite often when you hear people talking about long working weeks, one of the things that they compromise is the amount of sleep they get. And sleep scientists were fascinated. The, the average human is happiest and most motivated when they get at least about seven and seven and a half hours sleep a night. But there are people who claim to not need that amount, to not need that amount of sleep. And so sleep scientists were really interested in measuring the different brain that they had. You might, rem you might have read this in the book. Uh, they invited people who didn't need that amount of sleep into the laboratory, and they loaded them into fRMI brain scanners. You know those things are sort of the big, almost vast military-like devices that you slide. You get people on a bed and you slide them in. Seventy-five percent of the people who claim to not need enough sleep, uh, sufficient sleep, when they were loaded into the fRMI brain scanner, fell asleep in the machine. And the conclusion was they were probably misleading themselves. In fact, my, uh, alongside Elon Musk, uh, Marissa Meyer, who was the long term, was the, the CEO of Yahoo. She was probably, if you were writing the film of Marissa Meyer's life, um, when she was asked the secret of her success, uh, she, she omitted the important detail, which was that she was employee number 20 at Google. And she was asked the secret of her success. She said it was working 17 hours a day, never going on vacation sleeping under her desk twice a week, and often holding in a wee for hours at a time. And it uh, seems like an interesting detail to include. Uh, but where did you work again? Uh, she didn't mention where she worked. But if she wanted to know, so we often tell ourselves a lie. And I wonder if this is a lie. So let's have a look at the evidence. First thing we could do is probably the most uh, comprehensive piece of work done on this was done by a guy called uh, Penkeville from Stanford University. And Penkeval uh, did, uh, I've forgotten his first name, uh, Penkeval did this uh, thorough analysis looking at the marginal return at hours worked. And what he concluded, that over 56 hours work a week, the marginal return on work is, is zero and, and negative. That actually physical work this was, physical work, the marginal return, uh, as soon as you hit 56 hours, you were better not working than working. So if you worked eight hours a day, seven days a week, you were better taking Sunday off work. Your productivity would go up rather than working on that Sunday. Okay, that doesn't necessarily uh, bond with what Elon's saying, but clearly that was physical labour. Now, do any of us feel that physical labour might be different to mental labour? Absolutely. Let's have a look at the science of that because Elon, it's even worse for you. The science I want to show you here, now, this is something called ego depletion. There is no shortage, if you go to Google Scholar, there's no shortage of papers on ego depletion. And you're going to find arguments and, and quibbling around the fringe. Probably the best summary I can give you about ego depletion is from a book called uh, The Organised Mind by Daniel Leverton. If you leave here today and you buy one book and it is The Organised Mind by Daniel Leverton, I have failed. Because that book is ter terrifically bad. It's awful. That book, I'm going to show you the only thing that's worthy 
And I'm going to give you that. If you want to photograph this, photograph this. Do not buy that book. <laughs> Our brains are configured to make a certain number of decisions per day. And once we reach that limit, we can't make any more, regardless of how important they are. Okay. Let's just, let's just think about what that means. Our brains are configured, configured to make a certain number of decisions per day. And once we reach that number, we can't make any more, regardless of how important they are. That's kind of the opposite of what Elon's saying, right? The, the, the notion that we've got into our head that somehow, if we're hustling, if we're working longer, harder, we're doing more. But if work and cognition is zero sum, then working longer actually serves to dilute it. I think if, even if you don't believe that evidence, then I would ask you to, to take the word of the greatest living British person, Andy Murray. Andy Murray was asked... Uh, what he felt the difference was between five set matches and three set matches. And he said, to be honest, when he was well number one, he said, to be honest, the top three or four players were sort of so much fitter than the other players, we, we relish a longer match. The challenge of a five set tennis match is when you've been playing tennis for five hours, you, you lose the ability to make decisions. He said, your brain is incapable of making the quality of decisions you make at the start. Kind of co-discovery of the ego depletion point, right? Co-discovery of the fact that our brains are finite rather than infinite. And the, the danger is, of course, that we can see evidence of this everywhere and we're ignoring it. Albert Einstein used to do something where he'd wear the same outfit every day. Why? Because he discovered when he turned up at the lab, his thinking was fresher. Actually, when we're, we're not treating our brain as infinite, we're treating it as finite. It seems that it's in service of getting more done. In fact, the more we understand how our brains work, the more we start questioning the way that we're working might be completely wrong. If there was a GCSE neuroscience, the one thing that would be included in that is there are three systems that, in, that operate within the brain. The first system is the executive attention network. That's us doing stuff. Picking up the pen, writing with it, that's your executive attention network. Then there's the salience network, and the salience network runs background predictions anywhere we are. It's, sort of, it's managing us, making sure that we feel safe. And the third one is the, it's sometimes called the default mode or the default network. And we access this, in, back to, it, to those FRMI brain scanners, we access this by giving someone something to do and then watching what happens when they stop doing it. It's sort of like the daydream mode. And the strange thing is, is that when you ask people when they had their creative ideas, they more often say times when they were actually in that default mode than when they were in the active mode. People say to me, I chatted to someone the other day, he said, I have all my ideas when I'm walking my dog. Someone said, I actually get all my ideas when I'm on holiday. Someone said, I have all my ideas on the toilet. <laughs> and, uh, but interestingly, Aaron Sorkin is my favourite example of this. Aaron Sorkin is an award-winning screenwriter. He wrote uh, the West Wing TV show. He wrote Social Network film. And he said, he came to the conclusion that all of his ideas happened when he was in the shower. He says uh, he had a shower installed in the corner of his office. He has eight to ten showers a day. <laughs> I presented to a cosmetics firm last week. They said, we hope he has a good moisturising routine. Uh, um, but the, the, so, so actually, our brains often are finding creativity not in being overscheduled in an Elon Musk 80 hour week style, but rather in finding looseness and, and not being overscheduled. So I think b based on that, the science of both uh, the Penkeville from Stanford and ego depletion, it's fair to say that Elon Musk is cancelled. Now we turn our attention to Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright, I'm attributing the blame to Frank Lloyd Wright for something that was a, a co-creation amongst a lot of people. And I'm blaming Frank Lloyd Wright for open plan offices. My contention is open plan offices are ruining the research of everyone in this room. And I want to show you why. So Frank Lloyd Wright, he was, this is a, a quotation attributed about him. He saw walls and rooms as downright fascistic. And of course, when we ask architects to create something beautiful, it's definitely true that open plan photographs far better than a series of small grotty cubicles. But it seems that open plan offices are just about the worst thing for our, our productivity at work. To the extent, open plan offices cost about a third the cost of, uh, of contained offices. But it seems that even with that taking into account, 
they're a false economy. Probably the best thing, and there's no shortage of uh, evidence and research about open plan, but probably the best thing I can say to you about open plan is that in the biggest survey that's been done on it, open plan offices, the introduction of them, leads to a reduction in face-to-face -face conversations by 73% and an increase in emails by two-thirds. The, the notion that we're often sold when it comes to open plan is somehow we're going to be jiving together in this ideas savannah. We're going to be galloping across the open plains and exchanging ideas as we go. And it's, nothing could be further from the truth. Probably my favourite example of this uh, was people who decided to look at evidence. And they weren't looking for the evidence of open plan. This was an experiment conducted on computer scientists. And the computer scientists, they wanted to do a piece of work. They, took, they did something called the coding war games. So this was a piece of work that took 600 developers across 100 different companies. They were put into teams of two, and the teams of two were instructed to create a medium-sized program in their normal working conditions. So they had to sit at their normal desk in the normal surroundings that they, they operated in. And they were given the time to do it. The interesting thing about the coding war games is while the results were completely stratified, the best teams were 10 times better than the worst teams. The best teams were two and a half times better than the average. But the interesting thing is that didn't remotely correlate to the amount of experience they had or their level of seniority. In fact, the performance largely resulted from how private their working environment was. The worst teams, 75% of the worst teams, said that they, they were con constantly interrupted in their environment. Sound familiar? Uh, the best performing teams, 63% uh, of them, said that their working environment was acceptably private. Hang on, we've just, we've just created something that looks beautiful, that is completely opposed to the way that we're going to be the most productive version of ourselves. See, this seems incredible that no one raises the issue that open plan is the enemy of us getting our work done. But that is exactly right. And for that reason, Frank Lloyd Wright, you're cancelled. Right, finally, let's go on and look. Before we sort of look at ways that we can improve, work, let's take a look at the final one. Now, Reed Hastings is famous for creating a, a document, look, formidable achievement of what he's done at Netflix. He's the CEO of Netflix. Netflix are a fascinating business because they've re reinvented themselves uh, three times. They, they were a DVD, they were a DVD by post business. They then decided to become a streaming business. And one of the remarkable things that they, they decided during that is they decided even though streaming accounted for less than 1% of their revenue, they stopped the people from the DVD part of the business coming to meetings. Wow. Right, that's like the big cultural decisions. They reinvented themselves as a streaming business. Then having reinvented themselves as a streaming business, recognizing that they were, they were pretty much reliant on the, the, uh, the rights they bought from studios, they created themselves as a original content business. So they've reinvented themselves along the way. Formidable achievement. However, there's one thing in their published culture document that I really take issue with, and it's this. Reed Hastings says, we're a team, not a family. Okay, and he says it in a sort of disparaging way, almost like if you feel any affection, any affiliation with the people you work with here, you're somehow failing. If you're interested in workplace culture, the, uh, the Netflix culture document, Sheryl Sandberg called it the most important document to come out of Silicon Valley. It's a remarkable read because it's the most extremely neoliberal text I think you'll, you'll ever find. They say the day they published it, applications to go and work at Netflix, ha Netflix halved. People saw it. One thing you'll find in the document, it says that if you're... Uh, if, your, if your scorecard, if your end of term uh, report that you were taking home to your parents, if it had A for effort, but B for performance, we would pay you to leave the company. We, you're, you've no longer got a job here. It's, it's, it's like the Hunger Games of work environments. <laughs> so, let's see. So, Reed Hastings says that we're a team, not a family. I thought we'd take a look at whether that's actually, firstly, healthy, and secondly, borne out by, uh, by evidence. Now... While I'm going to 
uh, emphasize and show you scientific evidence, I thought a good place to start here would be Frederick II. And he was the Holy Roman Emperor from, from the 13th century. Frederick II was a precursor to the market research industry because he was fond of A-B tests. And uh, so way ahead of his time, albeit the, he created a kingdom that ran from Germany, Italy, down to Jerusalem. Formidable achievements. Uh, he, he was fascinated with scientific discovery. One of the A-B tests he did, he's, he got invited to uh, local peasants in. He gave them a hearty meal. And then at the end of their meal, he sent one of them out on a hunting expedition. You know, I want you to spend the night chasing after gazelles, have a, a, a romp across the field, come back at dawn. The other di- guy, he instructed to get a good night's sleep. At dawn, he slaughtered them both to have a look inside their stomach to see which one had digested more food. Okay. Did I sign that? Uh, Another guy, he he, uh, hammered into a barrel and he cut a small hole in the side of the barrel to see when the guy eventually died, will his spirit sneak out of the barrel? No, it turned out. Uh, And the the final one he did that I I was most taken with, is he decided that humans, apart from the the German or the Italian or the the language that we teach them. He was interested whether they had a native language. Do humans have a native language like the animal kingdom? What what would be the language that humans speak if we didn't teach them? So he took some babies from their mums and he handed them to nannies. And the nannies were instructed, don't nurture the baby at all. Don't talk to the baby. Don't look at the baby. Don't engage with the baby. Don't cuddle the baby. Do nothing other than feed it and change it. And he was interested, what would happen? How would that baby flourish? Half of all those babies died. And it's an interesting thing, because it seems that uh, belongingness seems to be far more important to us as human entities, as beings. It seems to be far more important to us than we sometimes give credit. In fact, all of us are familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but probably you're not familiar with the work by Roy Baumeister and Frank Leary, uh, Mark Leary. And Mark Leary, they did a paper that, if, if you go to, go to Google Scholar, it's one of the most widely uh, peer-reviewed papers that I've seen on there. And they took issue with uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. In fact, they say all of the evidence suggests that belongingness doesn't follow food and shelter. It's equally as important as food and shelter. In their paper, they say much of what, the hu- of what human beings do is done in the service of belongingness. So... I guess why that's relevant is because if we're saying that having sort of connections with people around us is a luxury, it seems not to be borne out by the evidence. People need a sense of belonging. First reason why I think this is especially interesting, 42% of British adults say that they don't have a single friend at work. We've engineered modern work to be incredibly lonely. And it's, so uh, I think when we talk about a loneliness epidemic, tends... uh, I think there's about 6 million people who spend Christmas Day alone every year. There's also loneliness at work. My favourite bit of research on this, uh, it was done by Julianne uh, holt Lundstadt, And she, she did a meta-analysis of... Uh, a, a effectively aggregated about 3.5 three million adults' worth of research. And what she found was loneliness actually was a bigger cause of premature death than obesity. That effectively, when we allow people to be lonely, it seems to be the quickest way to them feeling like they have no purpose in life and them feeling like they have no reason to continue. So, extreme examples, but I wonder if you can apply it to work. Well, there's significant work been done by that. So, if belongingness seems to be a human requirement, then how would that apply itself to, to the, our jobs? And this was uh, work by Sigal Barside, she's from Wharton University, and she, she explored something called companion love. And companion love is that feeling we have when we're surrounded with people, we enjoy their company, we feel like we're more energised. In fact, what Sigal Barside found, she did a, a, a piece of work that extended across about 3,000 adults, uh, uh, seven different industries, and she found that when people ex- exhibited companionate love with the people they worked with, they were more accountable, they were more energized, they were more motivated, and they felt more content in their jobs. Actually, far from being a luxury, far from being something that we should be proud of, feeling like you're a team, not a family, probably is a completely wrong way to try and engineer work. So, hopefully, I've given you sort of an illustration of why science might suggest that these people, I wouldn't want to profile them, 
but white men of a certain age, uh, why these, they seem to be giving us an indication of something that's completely wrong. 